Hi, everyone. We're going to give a couple more minutes to let people join and then we'll get started. So thank you for joining the ABSC webinar series. This series will be building on one another, providing a variety of topics that will come in hand handy to answer questions that may arise when adding CBD to your pet's regimen. Tonight, Dr. Stephanie McGrath will be presenting part one of Best Buds CBD Trials in Our Furry Friends. Dr. McGrath is an associate professor at Colorado State University College of Veterinary Medicine and Biomedical Sciences. Many of you know her as the principal investigator and lead researcher on multiple clinical trials using applied basic science CBD oil. First, the safety trial, and then the trials for epilepsy and osteoarthritis. Welcome, Dr. McGrath. Hi, thanks, Jessica. Um, we'll assume you can hear me unless you say otherwise. Um, thanks for again for the introduction. This has been a fun series. Um, I look forward to this evening. I am going to talk to you a little bit more about what Jessica just mentioned, which is the, um, the trials that we've been doing. So I have broken, oops, hold on, broken tonight's um, discussion a little bit um, up for us so that we're not too, um, it's not too lengthy and overwhelming um, with trying to prevent the science or present the science all at the same time. So. Today's webinar will be a little bit more focused on some of the background. So my background is getting started with CBD, CBD in general, a little bit of a historical perspective on things, some of the challenges that we've encountered with cannabis research, as well as some of the very preliminary studies that we were able to perform here at CSU with Applied Basic Science Corporations, um, both their sponsorship as well as their um, product. And then in February, we'll talk about um, a little bit more of the clinical trials, meaning giving it to animals for certain diseases and presenting some of the data that we found there. So this evening, um, I will start a little bit with my background as a veterinary, veterinary neurologist and kind of the types of things that I see, because it's been really interesting for me. I, you know, you go through school and probably it's similar in many careers, but you kind of go through school, you learn from books, you learn from, you know, maybe papers and teachers and all that um, more didactic kind of, kind of situation. And then you get out into the world. And for me, obviously it was being a veterinary neurologist, but again, I would imagine it would be true for any career. You get out there and then you encounter the real challenges and the real life um, scenarios that um, for me anyway, it was much more eye-opening and much more, um, you know, in some ways powerful than learning about diseases in a textbook. And so that's kind of how my whole research career got started. I'm gonna to switch to the next slide. Um, it is, a, I shouldn't say graphic, but it can be a little bit disturbing. So if, um, if that's something that is um, bothersome to you, you might not wanna watch. The next one, um, it is a dog having a seizure. So this is um, literally what I, 
deal with every single day, multiple times a day, often the actual seizure episode, oftentimes just the aftermath of the seizure. So trying to deal with the family and the emotional aspect and the medication aspect. Um, and it, for me, this has been a very, um, this was a big eye opener. Again, you know, I, I read in textbooks, this is what um, epilepsy is. This is what's happening in the brain. This is how we treat it. But until you watch this um, violent and very dramatic and alarming event, um, it's hard to, for me, it was very hard to kind of grasp that the rest of um, the emotions that go along with the disease. And, you know, you can sit there and talk to this family and say, oh, he didn't remember anything. It doesn't hurt. He had no idea what happened. But they're the ones that look into their dog's eyes every day and have to watch this and, and deal with it. And it's really all that, not all that comforting, to be honest. It's very um, frustrating and a very devastating disease. And so for me, I had, I had a lot of trouble kind of wrapping my head around this particular disease. And there are others. I mean, chronic pain is incredibly frustrating. Um, anxiety can be really challenging and very, you know, life altering for a lot of owners and dogs. Um, and, you know, spinal cord injuries, all kinds of things that we see and encounter commonly that we don't have great treatments for at this point, at least for a, a you know, a portion of that population. And so, um, you know, again, for me, that was epilepsy. And with it being the most common neurological condition in dogs it is something, again, that as a neurologist, I see all the time. And I'm, I fail. I fail at treating these dogs almost a third of the time, which is again, pretty, you know, you read that number and you're like, well, 70 to 80% of the time I'm going to do great, but it's the powerful ones that are in that, in that, you know, uh, 25, 30% group that you're like, oh my gosh, I'm, I'm failing you. I can't, I can't get this under control. And that is incredibly frustrating, of course, for the family, but also as a doctor and a scientist, um, we also encounter in veterinary medicine, euthanasia. I've, you know, again, I, I finished my residency and I was like, all right, I'm going to treat these dogs with, um, you know, medicine A and medicine B and medicine C and medicine D. And I did it. I did it. I won. I conquered this disease. And then when the owners walk in a month later to, for euthanasia, because you've taken their dog and altered him so much that they perceive that although the seizures are well controlled, he has no quality of life anymore um, until you're put in that situation. And, and it's, it's not, and you know, it's, it's fair of the owners, but it's really a, you know, a hard thing for a doctor to have felt like they won and really they didn't. And so all of this really just to say that in those first few years out of my residency, I really um, realized that there's a lot of medical conditions that we're not um, sufficient at treating and that we don't have a good answer for, again, at least in a subset of dogs. And so that's kind of where I started wondering about being a clinical researcher um, to try to help add to some of that, um, that science, help answer some of those questions, add some of those pieces to the puzzle. And so that's what kind of jump started things for me, epilepsy, epilepsy being sort of on the forefront of my mind at this time. And this was all around 2014, 2015. Um, and in 2014 was when uh, businesses were allowed to sell um, medical and recreational marijuana in Colorado. And so at the same time that I'm realizing that I kind of want to start contributing to this clinical research side of my career, I also am encountering a lot of questions and inquiries about cannabis and marijuana and cannabidiol or CBD. And um, the more I look into that medication, I am starting to realize that there's a lot of unanswered questions there as well. And so it really took um, watching, well, first of all, um, having some conversations with applied basic science with David Moshe and Alan Shackelford, the uh, founders of ABSC, and having some discussions about um, about cannabis and its role in veterinary medicine. And around a similar time, um, I also was able to watch this episode of um, Weed with Sanjay Gupta on CNN. And this also just was starting to kind of all fit together for me. So I'll play this briefly, brief little clip from it, just so you can kind of see how, how things started coming together. Your kids. A special investigation, Weed. Uh, okay, baby. <laughs> 
This is their daughter, Charlotte, having a seizure. It led to the first of many trips to the ER. They did the million dollar workup, the MRI, EEG, spinal tap, you know, they did the whole workup and found nothing. For the next two years, the Figgies tried everything, strange diets, acupuncture, and dozens of powerful drugs like Valium, Ativan, phenobarbital, but nothing seemed to help. Even worse, some of the medications nearly killed her. Dr. Alan Shackelford is a Harvard-trained physician. He's also among a handful of doctors in Colorado who give prescriptions for medical marijuana. From the moment Charlotte entered his office, he knew she was in trouble. While he was just examining her, she had two seizures. She'd failed everything. Uh, there were no more options for her. Everything had been tried, except cannabis. So as you can imagine, that was kind of a powerful episode for me, um, just watching this and being um, family and friends with Dr. Shackelford and, and David Moshe. And so it's kind of all culminating and coming together. The little girl in the um, CNN episode, Charlotte Figgy, for which Charlotte's Web and many people, at least in Colorado, are familiar with Charlotte's Web strain of CBD, um, was having about 350 seizures per week. Um, she lived in a wheelchair, was completely dysfunctional. Um, and as you saw in the show, she moved to her family moved to Colorado to um, to try cannabis, and essentially um, was successful in making her seizure free. Um, she was always a little bit developmentally slow, but otherwise a very functional, um, uh, happy uh, little girl that went from this to uh, running and walking and riding bikes and um, and hiking and and living a fairly normal life. So it was, um, you know, again, pretty important for me to see. And I didn't know if CBD was an appropriate thing to use in veterinary medicine. It hadn't been done before. So I had really no idea at the time, but I was um, really interested in finding out what that role potentially could be. Um, so I started thinking more about the plant in general. To be totally honest with you, I, I knew very little about it. Um, you know, I knew that marijuana was bad for dogs, um, at least at certain dosages, it could be toxic. And so I've always sort of shied away from it on, on the medical side and in our field, but seeing this little girl um, go from dysfunctional to functional made me start thinking that maybe there's this other portion of the plant that might be more um, appropriate and safe for our veterinary patients. And so, um, you know, do I think that it can do everything on this list? I don't, I don't know. Um, I'm a skeptic, so probably not. But do I think that it has its role in medicine, at least for certain diseases? I think that the answer is yes, but it was time to sort of think about it and try to figure it out. So I won't hopefully bore you too much, but I really thrive and really engage in the history. Um, I am not really interested in looking at an, you know, quote unquote illegal substance or kind of just entering the world of legality. Um, if it's just a snake oil and this, you know, it really carries that negative connotation that it had for me in the past. So I sort of delved into a little bit of its his history and, and I found it fascinating. So I was hoping just to share a couple of slides on, on my sort of journey through the history of cannabis, where I realized it was first used in Europe and Asia about 10,000 years ago. It was first traded transcontinentally about 5,000 years ago. Um, and I mean, to me, that was just awe-inspiring. I mean, this plant has been around forever and used recreationally and medicinally for a very, I mean, longer than I can wrap my head around. Um, it's been sort of traveling across um, Russia, the Ukraine, Europe, Asia, is just kind of making its way. Um, and eventually uh, transcontinentally, so it was used um, medicinally in Asia where it was first introduced to Africa. Um, and then from Africa over to South America via the slave trade. Um, in fact, in Brazil, it's still known by its African name, Diamba. And that occurred between the 17th and 19th centuries. Um, interesting fun fact I came across was that marijuana residue was found in Shakespeare's pipe in 2001. Um, and he, uh, his work was done around um, the late 1500s and early 1600s. So again, it's 
obviously inspired some of his work theoretically and um, and what again has just proven that it's been around for a really long time. <clears throat> and so back to the medical side, um, this in the early 19th century, this Irish doctor working in India by the name of William Brooke O'Shaughnessy um, used cannabis, um, kind of adapted it from Indian medicine and used it for um, infantile seizures, rheumatism, spasms, other movement disorders, and really helped contribute to its rapid spread among physicians to the point that by the late 19th century, it was a very popular component of British and American physicians. So in fact, held in quite high regard um, and not, um, you know, it really didn't have this, this negative view that we had, you know, going into the 1900s. And so what happened? Um, well, things started really falling apart in the early 1900s. Uh, the Mexican revolution in 1910 led to waves of immigrants crossing over to the United States. And interestingly, the, these new arrivals smoked um, marijuana instead of using it as an oral tincture. Um, just remember that for a second. And then around a similar time, African American, um, the African American migration of New Orleans and other port cities started heading north. Um, and those folks also smoked it. And so we're kind of, um, we have a bunch of movement um, and immigrants and they, um, they were different. They used it differently than we had historically um, in the United States. And so, um, as we, let's see, as we move into um, the early to mid 1900s, we have this guy, um, Harry An Anslinger, who assumed the head of the Bureau of Narco Narcotics in 1930. Well, he didn't like Mexican Americans. He didn't like African Americans. Um, interestingly, he didn't like jazz, um, which I thought was strange. Uh, marijuana is taken by musicians, and I'm not speaking about the good musicians, but the jazz types. So clearly he had um, a bit of a chip on his shoulder, shall we say, nicely. Um, and he started what is now known as, or what was later known as the War on Drugs. 1937, uh, cannabis passed sorry, Congress passed the Marijuana Tax Act, which made cannabis more expensive, difficult to obtain. And then we have President Nixon coming in um, in 1970 to sign uh, the Controlled Substances Act, which really essentially was the nail in the coffin. It's what drove cannabis into the ground in the US. So, um, so I found that really, really interesting. I mean, for a hundred years, basically this has been um, criminalized where, in other areas of the world, it's continued to be studied and respected. Um, so the um, next, this slide is introducing Raphael Meshalam, who later became known as the godfather of cannabis research and rightfully so. Um, he, in the 1960s, um, kind of started his work. He was a Bulgarian born Israeli chemist who really was the first scientist to map the chemical structure of CBD and THC, the most common um, or well-known um, cannabinoids that are produced by the cannabis plant. Um, so while America is uh, valiantly fighting its war on drugs, Dr. Meshalam is making quite um, amazing, remarkable discoveries. Um, throughout the 60s, 70s, 80s, and 90s, he's learning about the endocannabinoid system, the cannabis plant, the different phytocannabinoids that are produced, how they act on our, our body um, to produce different um, either sensations or have medicinal values. So it was really um, amazing. In 1992, in fact, he discovered um, anandamide, which was um, the first endogenous cannabinoids so produced by our body, which he named um, anandamide, which is Sanskrit for supreme joy, which is also what we think is responsible for the runner's high. So in other parts of the world, we're really making amazing scientific strides and kind of halted um, all move, forward movement in the United States. So that's kind of where, um, where this is all um, you know, historically coming from. Um, so while this research is taking place in labs, we finally hit the 21st century in the US where cannabis is now of course booming. Um, really you have to be um, living under a rock to not see what's happening to cannabis in this country. It's taken off legally, it's taken off in popularity. Um, you really can't help but pay attention at this point. And so, you know, I really kind of got to this point and realized that this plant should be 
you know, again, do, do I think it does this miracle drug that's going to treat every single thing and every single person? I really don't, but I do think it should be respected. I felt very comfortable doing the research um, to start looking at this plant because of how, um, you know, how, how respected I and revered I think it should be. And so I felt um, really good moving forward with the research. So sorry, I hope that wasn't too boring, but for me, it really kind of helped um, bring me to where I am and to help me understand why we, why it's really critical that we start putting some science behind this plant, um, probably far later than we should have been um, if we had avoided the 1900s. But alas, here we are. So we know CBD is out there. We know people are using it. Um, people are getting excited about its potential gaining traction, but unfortunately we still know very little bit, very little about it from a scientific standpoint, especially in veterinary medicine. I mean, there's essentially nothing in veterinary medicine and this is, you know, 2014, 2015, so not that long ago. Um, so, you know, I, I kind of am realizing that I want to, um, want to begin and spearhead some of the research in this field. And so that kind of brings me full circle back to my day job, epilepsy and dogs. We know we have a huge problem. We don't have a clear solution. Um, we have lots of uh, drugs on the shelf and in our, you know, our medicine cabinets that sometimes work, sometimes don't, sometimes cause unacceptable side effects. And so, um, so I am obviously at this point really interested in moving forward, again, around the same time I came across this um, New York Times Magazine cover with this little gummy bear. And again, it, it you know, obviously touts that it does everything. Again, I, I don't know. But one of them was that it stops epilepsy, which, you know, kind of got me thinking. Um, that's exciting. Um, so I really um, am interested in moving forward. And so my next big question is, can I do the CBD research at CSU? Um, no one's doing this research. Why? Um, as you probably all are aware, the legal side of things is still very gray, but even as recently as five years ago was even grayer. So would I, would I be allowed to do this research? And again, I'm looking at CBD and not uh, medical marijuana. So low THC product, but still it's, it was, um, I was worried that I would be met with, um, uh, too much, um, too many obstacles to move forward. But um, fortunately in 2014, there was um, the 2014 Farm Bill, at least according to CSU's take on it, really did seem to make it a possibility for us to do use CBD for research purposes in the state of Colorado. And so they were comfortable with some of those preliminary studies working underneath the 2014 Farm Bill. Well, in 2018, um, the farm bill that was signed actually removed hemp from the list of controlled substances for the first time in 100 years. And so, um, I guess a little less, but still a long time, um, which allowed states to regulate the production and it also descheduled um, the drug. But unfortunately, it still didn't make it use or legal for therapeutic use. So it still made it so that veterinarians were not allowed to prescribe it, to, um, to recommend it, to sell it, et cetera. But at least it made it easier for research purposes um, and allowed, I think, us to move forward very comfortably with some of the research and trials that we um, were, were set to do. So at this point, we have the thumbs up from CSU. We have um, uh, kind of research questions and hypotheses in mind. And so the next big hurdle is funding and any research project. But like I mentioned earlier, I've kind of developed this relationship with Alan Shackelford and David Moshe, who again, were kind of the, the had the foresight to realize that yes, they wanted to enter the veterinary space. They wanted to make a, a high quality product, but in order to do so, they needed to support some of these preliminary studies and provide ongoing support for trials. And so they were actually um, very proactive in uh, making it clear that they were interested in, um, in helping fund and move forward the science in order to ensure that they were, you know, part of that sort of progressive forward, forward, progress, 
forward movement. And so um, I was really lucky to um, have this kind of all culminate at the same time and be able to actually, um, you know, get to work on some of this um, long overdue research. So, um, so I got really excited on this kind of like young, naive, um, really enthusiastic researcher, and I'm ready to just like throw CBD at these dogs with epilepsy and see if it does anything. Um, but unfortunately, that's not how research works. Um, you have to lay a foundation, especially on, a, I would call it a new drug. Obviously, we all know it's not, but a poorly researched drug. Um, and so I had to start at the beginning, which um, can be frustrating, but at the same time is the value in that is actually incredibly important. Um, understanding what it's doing is something that is um, appropriate and the right way to, to approach research before we just give it to people's animals and their family members. So we started um, at the beginning. So we literally did not know what CBD would do in a dog's body. Um, there were a few studies in humans, um, a few studies in mice and rodents, um, but honestly really nothing to speak of um, as far as a, a good solid scientific study in, in um, dogs and companion animals for that matter. So we started out with a, a PK study or pharmacokinetic study looking at what this drug did in 30 research dogs. So these are just healthy dogs. Um, and we looked at several different formulations. So again, we didn't know whether an oral um, form or whether a cream or, you know, and people have talked about inhalants and other um, ways of delivering the CBD. We weren't sure which would, um, which would work best. And so we had to start somewhere. We picked these three um, oral capsule, oral oil, and transdermal cream. So a cream that you rub on um, skin and cross, um, theoretically crosses the skin and enters the bloodstream that way. We looked at two different dosages. So we looked at a kind of a lower and a higher dose um, to see again where we were um, in the blood. And so we, you don't have this kind of busy slide, but the point being is that we took five dogs um, out of those 30 and divided them into six groups. So each group received one of those different method, delivery methods. And then within that um, delivery method, five dogs received the lower dose, five dogs received the higher dose. And we took a ton of blood samples um, and tried to figure out whether um, we were, well, first of all, can you even measure this in the blood? That was our first question. Um, is it even entering the system, so to speak? And, um, and if so, what kind of plasma levels, what kind of blood levels were we even reaching? And, you know, again, whether these levels are sufficient to treat a disease, we didn't know, but again, we needed to start somewhere and start building up this um, knowledge base. And so we um, were able to measure the doses in different dogs. I just gave one example. I don't need to put up a million graphs for you guys to look at, but question A was, can it be measured? And it can, and that was super exciting. There's actually a reasonable amount of um, skepticism and concern that when you take uh, CBD orally, because it's so what they call lipophilic, because it's so um, uh, hard to dissolve in our in our intestinal system and in our stomach, we were worried that it wouldn't even enter the bloodstream, that it would just basically be excreted. And so we were really excited to see that at, you know, moderate doses, we're actually able to see um, what seemed like reasonable and very consistent blood levels. And so that was kind of our first um, excitement. Um, and we also were able to do, and again, um, if you're not super scientifically minded, you can sort of ignore this slide, but a lot of people are really interested in what kind of parameters we looked at. And so not only do we know that we can measure it, but we were able to make some calculations. So how long does this stay in the body? Um, how well is it systemically absorbed? What is the maximal concentration? So what does that whole kind of curve look like? And so we were able to really gather a lot of data from this um, preliminary study and kind of start setting the stage or building blocks for future studies. And so, and literally this was the first study of its kind, um, which is, you know, kind of unheard of in modern day um, medicine. It's kind of every drug kind of starts off this way um, right away. And so to have this be around forever and have no, having had no one really look at this in, in dogs or other animals or humans, even for that matter, um, really made this uh, quite powerful in my, in my opinion. 
So then we took these dogs because, okay, now we know we give them a dose. We know we can measure it. We kind of know where they're going to lie on that curve. We kind of look at the different formulations, like the oil really got absorbed nicely, the cream not as nicely. So we kind of are able to start working through some of these intricacies. Um, but is it safe? So will dogs tolerate it? Sure, they did fine after one dose, but no one's gonna give their dog one dose of CBD. And so we were able to dose these dogs for a total of six weeks, which I know isn't a super long time, but definitely adds a lot of data. And we're able to look at their blood levels over that time to make sure it actually stayed in their blood. And we were also able to monitor for any adverse effects. Um, also funded by Applied Basic Science. So they were willing to kind of go the full gamut, which was excellent. Um, and we were able to show that it stayed in their bloodstreams. Again, I won't go into details on this slide, but we were able to show that, yes, there's some variation, but we were able to maintain a reasonable level over the six week period of dosing. Um, as far as adverse effects, we did see diarrhea um, as one of the only real um, clinical effect. Um, the severity onset and duration did not seem to correlate with any of the doses or formulations. Like there were just kind of like these random bouts of diarrhea it didn't seem like things were really, we couldn't make any real associations um, with timing or, or dose or anything like that. Um, I'll give you a little bit of a spoiler alert. We actually have not seen this as a problem in our client owned animals. So there is some question about whether this is truly a side effect of CBD or whether there were other contributing factors of, you know, these dogs were getting blood draws and things where they stressed. Um, they were given a lot of, um, we have a lot of wonderful veterinary students with very big hearts. Um, and they would go out and socialize them. Well, socializing with beagles oftentimes means that you just like shove a bunch of treats at them because there's, that makes them so happy. So we also questioned a little bit um, about some diet um, concerns and, and excessive treats um, as well. So that was the main adverse effect for that group of dogs. We also did see some changes in their liver enzymes. Um, I know I've touched on this before and I will during the next webinar when we talk a little bit more about the trials. Um, but we did see some elevations in liver enzymes, mostly all in the dogs that received oral dosing, none of the cream. Um, so we do know when they take it orally, we know that it's metabolized by the liver. Um, we know that it um, interacts with the liver in such a way that it does cause it to, um, to excrete um, more of this particular enzyme, ALP, in the blood. Um, the question here, though, is a lot of drugs do that. So that doesn't, it's not unique to CBD, but, uh, you know, the real question here is how long, um, uh, or sorry, I should say, longer term studies would be necessary to really understand whether this is a problem with the liver or whether this is just, hey, yeah, it makes it a little leaky, it, you know, excretes this enzyme, blah, 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 who cares, they can take it for 10 years and no one cares or whether in a more long-term sense, this is going to be a problem. And so again, we're just kind of starting to chip away at some of the science, but at least in the short-term period of that six weeks, um, of that six week study, we did not see any signs of liver toxicity. The dogs did not have vomiting or inappet, you know, not eating, lethargy, sedation, anything that would be concerning. We also did some more specific liver tests called bile acid tests. And that actually looks at how well the liver is functioning after a meal and that remained normal. So that also gave us reason to believe that at least in that short-term period, it wasn't harming the liver. It was just causing a, an increase in that, um, in that enzyme. So, um, so lots of uh, work came out of this. I did list just a few other studies. There are certainly have, I'm not the only one doing this research. I was um, just at the beginning and um, staying active in it, but fortunately there's other people that are contributing to the science as well. So there have been a few other um, pharmacokinetic studies and all fairly similar. I mean, certainly some differences, but definitely um, uh, at least, you know, continuing to contribute to the science side. So we kind of ended our, our initial studies and we know at this point that CBD is well tolerated. Um, no dogs were remarkably sick from it at all. Um, just a few episodes of diarrhea. Otherwise they did great. Um, we know that we can see it in the blood, which was super important to us. Um, again, how, you know, whether that blood level is appropriate for an individual dog to stop having seizures, I don't know at this point, but at least we kind of have a starting point and we know that they can take oral CBD and it shows up in their blood 
upstream, which is great, um, but still a lot of unknowns at this point. So again, we're kind of setting that foundation for future trials. So what is the correct dose for treating um, chronic pain? What is the correct dose for treating anxiety or cancer or you know any of these epilepsy, any of these other diseases? We don't know that at this point. We don't know um, whether it even is effective for all of the diseases that we consider. Um, you know, maybe it works in certain dogs for certain diseases and, and why and how. And so there's still a lot of question marks. But again, um, you know, we, we had to start at, in my opinion, we had to start at the foundation and do it correctly. And so um, that's what, you know, where we launched from. And our next step, of course, was to move on to clinical trials. And so in the second part, um, next week I'll talk, or next month, I'll talk more about the specific trials that we've done so far. Um, ABSC has been, um, again, a huge supporter of the research at CSU um, and has provided the oil. Uh, we were fortunate enough to get some outside funding, so some um, some grants, one of which was the AKC Canine Health Foundation. So we're kind of able to move forward with these bigger studies, still with the support of ABSC, but, um, but we're able to obtain some, um, some outside or extramural funding as well. So moving forward, um, I'll talk to you about clinical trials, what we've done, what we know, still a lot of question marks of what we don't know, and then some future directives. Because again, this is, you know, I use this phrase too often, but this is truly the tip of the iceberg. There's so much more to discover about CBD and, you know, to keep these trials going and to keep the science moving forward, we have to continue doing the research and doing it well and providing veterinarians, pet owners with this information and in in an attempt to really um, start understanding that, um, that background and that science. And so, um, and giving them the ammunition to use this medication. Um, right now it's, you know, there's so many question marks, it makes it hard for pet owners and veterinarians to feel comfortable. And so I think the more we can contribute to the science, the more we can um, advance medicine. And so that's, um, that's next month. Um, so again, a huge thank you um, to lots of folks, but Applied Basic Science Corporation, again, um, it's been just a, um, a fun journey. And uh, I'm very uh, honored to be able to um, be one of the main researchers doing this with the help of um, ABSC. Uh, Pharmacology Shared Resource Lab is the lab that runs a lot of our, all of our um, CBD analyses. So they're, they've been um, integral in getting things going for me here as well. And then of course my clinical trials team. Um, I, am, I am not a one man show by any means, thank goodness. I have a wonderful team that backs me and um, I did include their email. They are um, very willing and open and um, happy to talk about anything, our trials, enrollment, um, you know, any, really anything um, that you guys have, might have questions about. So I included that there as well and I will end there. All right, thank you, Dr. McGrath. Um, so we have a couple of questions that I, we're gonna ask tonight. Um, I imagine a lot of the questions that have been presented this round will get answered in part two, so stay tuned, everyone. Um, but just to just to kind of keep the dialogue going a little bit more, um, are there any recommendations on how to treat a pet who experiences an increase of ALP while using CBD? Some yeah, liver totally. Yeah, great question, Jessica. Thanks um, for whoever asked it. That's really... Um, a really good question. And we're still trying to figure a lot of that out, but what my take on it right now. So again, sort of a spoiler alert, but we've treated dogs a lot longer than six weeks at this point. That was just kind of our initial trials. And we have fairly consistently seen an increase in ALP. Um, we have not seen any signs of liver dysfunction or liver failure or liver harm to that, to speak to that. Um, liver, the liver has um, appeared normal on ultrasound. The dogs had no other clinical signs. Um, bile acids test, that function test has remained normal. Um, so we don't have, again, I, I don't wanna overspeak, but we don't have any major concerns about that right now. Um, again, you know, even looking at them for a few months is not looking at dogs for three years and so, or 10 years. Um, so I think we still have a ways to go, but at least in a slightly longer period, we haven't seen any major problems. Um, that being said, what I generally kind of talk to veterinarians about is 
if you have a dog in liver failure that you know is not doing well with whether it's due to cancer or other hepatopathy, other liver issues, um, probably not an ideal candidate at this point. I just don't think we know enough that at least as, as a veterinarian, I don't think I would feel comfortable if we had a dog in liver failure starting CBD. Um, it, it might be just fine, but I kind of back away. Other than that, so as long as the dog starts out healthy, they see an increase in ALP, all I do is monitor it. So as long as it doesn't continue to go up and double and triple and quadruple, um, and it, as long as the dog shows no clinical signs, I'll just have them monitor it usually every like four to six months, um, just to make sure we're just kind of holding steady. I'll have them run that bile acids test once a year, just to, again, make sure that there's no signs of liver dysfunction. Um, and I don't do anything else. I mean, for other, um, you know, dogs that have liver issues, you can do a number of other um, medications to help protect it. But I don't, at this point, feel a need to do that. I haven't had any cause for concern um, in terms of liver um, harm. So I just, I do, I just monitor, make sure that it's not getting worse and I haven't encountered worsening at this point. So um, if I were to, then I would probably start one of the liver protectants that your veterinarian would normally use for liver disease, but other, or stop it. Um, but otherwise, yeah, I, that's kind of my kind of view on it at this point. Okay. Um, have there been any drug interactions or food effects? Um, ha have any been evaluated in the trials up to date? Um, <clears throat> good question. So, sorry, what was the first part you said? Food effect or? Uh, drug interactions okay. or food that affects CBD yes. and interactions. Um, no and yes. So <laughs> the first part, the drug interaction, we actually have not done, uh, as far as I'm aware, to be totally honest, I have not done a literature search in for this in probably about a month. So unless something came out super recently, in veterinary medicine, we have not done drug interaction studies with CBD and other drugs, whether it's anticonvulsants or um, non-steroidal anti-inflammatories that you use for arthritis, um, other behavior um, altering um, medications for anxiety. I haven't, there's been nothing. Um, so I, again, I think we really have a long way to go there. Um, and I look forward to doing some of those studies, but so far uh, we have not done a truly like a controlled study. Um, that being said, um, two things. One, we do treat dogs that are on concurrent medications with CBD and we have not seen a harmful effect. Um, I know that's very unscientific, but, um, but so far we have not seen a, what we would consider a drug interaction. Um, on the human side, they have done interaction studies too, I believe at this point with um, anti-epileptic drugs. So drugs, uh, anti-convulsive drugs for epilepsy. Um, and they did not find for the most part any significant changes in uh, blood levels um, based on you know, them being on an anti-convulsant and then adding CBD. It didn't significantly alter the vast majority of the drugs that the human epileptic patients were on. Um, there was um, one drug, we don't use it in veterinary medicine. Um, I think it, uh, I can't remember, but there was one that had a little bit of a change, um, but again, we don't use it, so I didn't pay a lot of attention. Um, and then the other, we do use zonisamide, but we haven't seen any changes on our side. And the only thing they saw in humans was a mild change in pediatric epileptics. So not even in adults. So I haven't paid a bunch of attention to that either, but we do need to do those studies. Um, so I would say caution at this point. I mean, I, I would be cautious. Uh, we, um, we don't know a lot yet. So that's um, a bit of a, of a gamble, a bit of an unknown. Um, with the food, yes, um, there have been multiple studies now that have shown that a, a meal. Um, it doesn't have to be any specific type of meal, but it does tend to help with the absor absorption of CBD. Um, and again, because of that sort of fatty, you know, CBD likes, it's, it's fatty. And so it likes fatty substances and that helps carry the CBD across um, the uh, intestinal tract to the bloodstream. And so it tends to be better absorbed when you take it just before, just after a meal, just in the vicinity of them having a meal. And again, it doesn't have to be anything. I mean, I think high fat would potentially be, I think they may have even done that in rats where higher fat meals will absorb it even better. But I think ultimately at, 
you know, you don't want to harm your dog by giving it a bunch of fat. So I think ultimately it's, um, if it, if you're giving it orally, then giving it with a meal is going to, um, be probably a, a better overall pharmacokinetic situation, get it absorbed better than without. All right. Um, one follow-up question to that uh, is, does it make sense to space out CBD versus the other me medications? Or do you think that's not necessarily, that's not necessary at this point? Yeah, good question. I would say at this point, I don't have any reason to believe it's necessary. Um, and again, take that for what it's worth, because I, I don't know, I can't prove that. Um, but I, especially if it's a chronic medication, you know, if this dog is taking anti-epileptic drugs or Rimadyl every day for arthritis and you're giving CBD, I think spacing it out by an hour or something, I don't think it's going to do anything. I mean, theoretically, you're kind of, when you, when you give a drug chronically, you're sort of, you're, you're hoping to sort of always stay, you know, just kind of go like this above that, that threshold. You never want to really drop to zero. And so theoretically, both uh, drugs are probably in the system um, at all times. And so I don't, honestly, I don't think it would matter that much to be totally honest is my, is my inclination, at least at this point. Okay. Um, and then my final question that I have here is could CBD be used in healthy pets as a supplement and or preventative? So um, again, question marks, again, we need more science, more research, but um, I think that there is potentially a place for that. Yes. Um, and I think it will a little bit depend on what you're treating. So people have talked about like Alzheimer's is a great example. In my opinion, we have doggy Alzheimer's. So we have dogs with cognitive that suffer from cognitive dysfunction actually incredibly commonly. Um, and that's a good disease example for giving it preventively. So they actually think that it might help um, help prevent some of the neurodegenerative changes that occur in the brain. So those normal aging changes that can kind of go awry, they think that CBD might help prevent some of that and help restore and, and, and keep um, more uh, functional pathways and prevent some of that, that degenerative process. And so theoretically, and no one's proven it, but theoretically for diseases like that, it might be really helpful to have, you know, maybe not from puppyhood, but to have a, a middle-aged dog on um, going forward on CBD. And so um, I do think that it's, it has the potential to provide some, um, some benefit. Uh, but again, I think, you know, if you want to try to prevent arthritis, I think that's pretty unlikely. If you want to try to treat it, that might work, but I don't know that I don't think you would prevent that process. So I think it a little bit depends on what you're trying to prevent, but I think if you're just trying to, um, use it as a supplement for, a better aging experience. Um, again, it's not proven, but I think that it could potentially have a role in that. Okay. All right. Well, um, so thank you to everyone who joined us tonight and thank you, Dr. McGrath for uh, providing such an insightful presentation. I look forward to part two. Um, just real quick, if you are wondering on how you can help with future with the future of pet CBD research, here's one way. The ABSC Pet Health Foundation was created to accomplish key goals in improving pet health care in the United States, including funding companion pet health research and clinical trials. Through donations, the foundation is able to award grants to scientists and professionals in research that address illnesses and the diagnosis of diseases and the development of effective treatments and the identification of disease prevention strategies. So to learn more or to make a tax deductible donation, please go to absccares.org. Um, as you can see, the, the website is in the top right-hand corner. If, um, so just remember two C's. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you so much, Jessica. And thanks to ABSC. I look forward to, um, to more research and to next month's presentation.